today, I dedicate this fantastic Holocaust Memorial to the memory of millions of men and my father, Jack Leipziger, who risked his life to save my That's what it sounded like at the official grand opening of the Toronto Holocaust Museum this past Friday, as 95-year-old survivor Nate Leipziger posed with Ontario Premier Doug Ford and other provincial, federal, and municipal politicians and dignitaries before museum officials asked the survivor to do the honours and cut the ceremonial ribbon. Whenever you're ready, you're welcome to cut it away. Leipziger is a well-known Holocaust educator with his trademark cap. He continues to speak with students despite his advanced age. Leipziger was 11 when the Nazis invaded Poland. He and his father survived seven concentration camps, including Auschwitz. But his mother and his only sister were killed there. Today, I dedicate this high-tech institution of discovery and learning to my sister Blima and millions of children who were deprived of the right to education. Leipziger's story is one of the featured videos that visitors encounter as soon as they enter the museum. They're front and center on screens in 11 life-size kiosks with 200 minutes of survivors telling their stories. The effect is powerful. It's like they're right there talking to you eye to eye, even though many of the survivors themselves have passed away. And these kiosks are just one way the new museum is using technology to adapt to what some have called a post-survivor world, where they have to teach about anti-Semitism and racism and hate that led the Nazis to murder six million Jews, but do the teaching without the first-person storytelling by flesh-and-blood survivors, a technique that's been a staple of Holocaust education since the first Holocaust museum opened in Toronto 50 years ago, just north of here, in a different building and was known as the Neuberger Holocaust Education Center. There are also augmented reality stations where visitors are given computer tablets where they can interact with artifacts or maps and experience it all through an even deeper layer of understanding. The new museum is also nearly three times the size of the last one, with room for up to 80,000 visitors a year, especially important now with rising anti-Semitism in the world and Holocaust distortion, and just in time to welcome classes of grade six students in the public school system in Ontario, because in the fall, Ontario will be the first province in Canada to make Holocaust education mandatory for that young age. What we want students to walk out of here with is curiosity about this period, wanting to learn more. And so if, if they live, leave here with more questions than answers, then we have actually think we've done our job well. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Monday, June the 12th, 2023. Welcome to the CJN Daily, a podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. Close to 500 people attended the grand opening of the museum on Friday. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was supposed to be there too, but he didn't come and no one was saying why, although it now appears it's because he went to a top secret trip to the Ukraine that day for a meeting with President Vladimir Zelensky, where he pledged more Canadian weapons and support to fight against the Russians. We at the CJN Daily were granted a private tour of the new museum ahead of the opening. And before I take you with me through the experience, I want to tell you, I've seen plenty of Holocaust museums before in Yad Vashem and in Washington, but I was surprised. I was actually moved to tears a couple of times. It's a very powerful experience. We went through it in about an hour. Give yourselves at least 90 minutes. So come along now as I start the tour with Executive Director Dara Solomon. You ride up to the second floor in the elevator. The doors open and... And you're surrounded by images of pre-war Jewish life because it's important for our visitors to first understand what was lost. And so you look around you, you see people going to shul, people dancing, riding bicycles, people at work. There's a scientist, there's a woman lighting Shabbat candles. And we really want to show the diversity of Jewish life before the war, especially for our non-Jewish audiences who don't know anything about Jews, and we want to show them what was lost first. And we also make the connection that you're standing in this Jewish building in a neighborhood that was actually founded by Holocaust survivors years ago at the Bathurst Manor in the 1950s. And so the 
the people can make the connection that despite the tragedies of the Shoah, Jewish life thrives in Canada and here in this particular spot in Toronto. There's the first of 11 testimony kiosks. Okay, we're going to walk over. Is in this um, Azrieli Legacy Hall. Um, at the f- forefront of this museum is survivor testimony. Why don't you touch it so we can hear what it says? Sure. So here, because we're exploring pre-war Jewish life, you can hear from a range of survivors. You can see at the top there's a question. Tell us about your life before the war. So let's click on Mark Lane, who is from Czechoslovakia. We had a prefab shul that was um, bought by my grandmother's brother and my Zadie. And um, there were always enough sons around that we had a million. And if they were... You see that the clips are super short, like a minute and a half, 50 seconds. What was the thinking behind that? So they're all inquiry-based. They're answering a particular question, and that's how students learn. They learn by exploring and discovering, and they do it by answering and thinking about questions. And so throughout the museum, you'll actually see questions posed throughout, and the answers are given by the survivors in these short clips that we know in this world we have people who with you know smaller attention spans so we're moving into the Toronto Holocaust Museum office space and so conference is, uh, center Freeman, and uh, family reception you're in the you're in the Freeman family reception area it is a ticketed um, museum experience. Visitors are encouraged to go online and pre-book a ticket for a particular time slot, like a lot of museums are doing these days. And this is where you'll be greeted by volunteers. So the first thing you do is come into our beautifully designed 360-degree theater, where we've developed three different films. One continues the narrative from outside about pre-war Jewish life. <laughs> You have people farming, you have people in the city, um, all the different sort of cultural groups, the different political groups Jews were part of, um, different types of work that they did do. You see people working on a loom right here, making wool. And of course, the singing was also very intentional. So you hear the different languages, the different styles of davening, the different cultural expressions. So you really see the richness of Jewish life before the war. Then there's one that's our sort of general film that really lays out the groundwork for how the Holocaust happened, the rise of Nazism and fascism. When learning about the Holocaust, we often ask questions. Why did this happen to the Jews? Who else was targeted? What conditions made the Holocaust possible? Referred to as the longest hatred, anti-Jewish sentiment can be traced as far back as... And then there's a film, a beautifully made film, for a younger learner that we're thinking of the grade 6 audience um, because Holocaust education was just made mandatory for that group and so that's for the the sort of beginner, the early learner, like starting in grade 6. It is inspired by um, Ye- Yael Spear Cohen, who was a, sur- a survivor speaker at the center for many years. So, set our holy books on fire. Many of the friends and neighbors who greeted me on my way to school every morning did nothing but watch. This was Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Okay, so now we're walking into the gallery. <gasps> so this is the first wow. gallery. This is Persecution, the 1930s. Um, and right away you can see you're surrounded by these kiosks to he- continue hearing from a Holocaust survivor. So if you want to just start, we can... I'm so sorry. It's made me cry because you see people who we deal with all the time, but they're life-sized. It's like they're right here with you. And then right behind it is a, is a uniform from the prison camps. This is very uh, emotional, even just being right here. I'm sorry, I don't usually cry at interviews. This is heavy stuff. Yeah. So. And then you see Max Eisen right here, and he passed away last year. So. Yeah, we recorded those large-scale testimonies that you're seeing specifically for these kiosks, and these were done in the fall of um, 2022. So. 
Max. Let's go Stage take a look and see if we can right touch one and see what it says. So let's hear from Max. The title of his clip is Poisonous Hatred. I remember I'm here in Duke's March in Yen. Uh, the Jewish businesses were confiscated. Uh, Jews, Jewish families lost their livelihood. Racial laws were um, posted on a daily basis. How did you decide what artifacts to put here and what to bring to the museum? So, as I've mentioned, the survivor narrative is at the core of the experience. And the, sur the surrounding walls, you can see, are graphics and texts and um, markers for the tablet experience, which I can explain in a moment. So, in most cases, these have been drawn from our community of descendants um, who for years had material. Some of it was in our previous museum space. Um, a lot of it came through the Beth Sedek collection that was um, dis dispersed at the um, recently. So, we're very lucky that all the Holocaust-related material came, came to us. So, if you want to walk towards... Um, this first case, this is a Torah that existed in our previous space, and it's, it's, it's a, a really special Torah. It was rescued during Kristallnacht by um, a chaplain who ended up giving it to Rabbi um, Plout, who eventually, who was a serviceman in the military, eventually in the American military, eventually made his way to Canada, and he had kept this all these years. And um, it was in our space, and it's a fragment of the Torah. And it's in a beautifully designed case just for that. Um, the, as the, move, the story moves forward into the 1930s, you have the Nuremberg race laws, the beginning of the isolation, identification, and humiliation of the Jews. So you start to see a number of different um, yellow stars that the Jews were forced to wear. Um, if you pull these drawers out, you can see additional material of like passports and immigration documents that were stamped with the J mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. so that the Jews were J, automatically yeah. identified. There's letters um, from families trying to leave because, you know, a common question is why didn't they just leave? And of course, it wasn't so easy. So here's a letter from um, George Brady's fam father. There's a number of Brady artifacts throughout the We museum. should just tell the listeners in case they don't remember. George Brady, of course, is the uh, family of Hannah's Suitcase, a famous children's book that has been in Jewish education uh, for 20 years. This is the 20th anniversary. Yeah. Um, George, of course, was Hannah Brady's brother. And so there's a material pulled from their collection that they've generously lent for this um, project. Um, so here there's a letter from George's father, um, you know, writing to the fam a family in the States asking, asking for help. Well, can we come? Will you bring us? And they respond like, we're too, we're too poor. We're not able to, to, to help you. We, I want to point out something really important. On, on each of the galleries, there are four Meanwhile in Canada panels. So every step along the way, students can be grounded in the history that they might be more familiar with, and it's important for them to understand how is Canada responding to what was going on in the Holocaust? How is the Jewish community responding? How much did they know? And how are the newspapers reporting on it? So in the 1930s, you have this... The Christie Pitts riots, of course, Christie is a Pitts big story. Riot, um, this year's an 90th anniversary. Yeah, and so that's the Globe article that's on the bottom. At the top is the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Hitler is sitting in the stands, and the Canadian Olympic figure skating team are clamoring for this man's autograph. And below that, you see a quote from Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie's diary talking about a, what a wonderful man he thought Hitler was. So we have we talk about anti-Semitism in Canada, Canada closing its borders. We also provide context. What was happening to other groups around Canada at that time? So we have content uh, about about the residential school system that was taking place in Canada during this time. How important was it to not make the Jewish tragedy? the only tragedy in, in this museum and how to have it relate to other tragedies because it's quite controversial to do that. So I would say we're, it, the Jewish tragedy is the main tragedy that's told here. We talk about the Holocaust, which is the genocide of six million Jews. But throughout the museum, there are different 
areas where we explore what happened to the Roma and Sinti. We talk about other um, prisoners of war, um, homosexuals who were targeted. Um, on one of the testimony kiosks, you can hear testimony from other victim groups. So it was important for us, because if you think about the students coming today, largely not Jewish, it's important for them to see that full history and to be able to maybe relate to it as, as well um, by learning about these other victim groups. Survivors in the 80s during Holocaust education of those days would not, would not have been happy about that. Uh, equivalencies. Mm -hmm. How do you see that this isn't happening today? I think a lot has changed. We have um, Holocaust survivors who've worked with us and who've done incredible work in the Indigenous communities and have gone up to northern Ontario to share their testimonies with um, survivors of the um, residential school system. So um, I think things have changed a lot, and um, Canada has changed as well, and we all recognize this is being taught in, in the schools, and it's important for us to sort of be part of that context. Additionally, there's a fantastic tablet experience. Students will be given a tablet, and there's a number of different tours. We'll our education team will discuss with the school group in advance what they're learning about and choose a tablet experience right for them. You can follow one survivor's narrative throughout. There's one that we're working on that's about the con contemporary anti-Semitism and how it connects to the history. There's one about choices. How did people choose to help, choose to collaborate, um, choose to just walk away and, you know, ignore what was happening around them. And so we really want students to sort of think about human behavior during that time. And so one of those tablet experiences will also support that learning. Um, there's these markers placed throughout the gallery that you hold the tablet up and augmented reality comes up on the tablet. So you, it appears that things are, I can show, yeah, yeah, out and show you. Um, and so that you can, so that they're really interactive, incredibly engaging for students to, to in, digest this content in new ways. So we're going to move in. So this was the beginning. This is... This is atrocity this and is devastation. Atrocity and devastation. So if you come to... They actually call it atrocity and devastation. If you come to your left, the first you have is the map. Again, so just to show you how it works, along the bottom are dates. And then the map is... Um, filled with hotspots, and if you go to say 1942, you can click on Czechoslovakia and learn about this euthanasia program that the Nazis had developed at this time, where they murdered approximately 790 children who were deemed mentally or physically unfit. Right. Um, you go on to another hotspot, 1944. Of course, this is when the concentration camp network had been established. And here it was really important for us to think about all the different experiences that our visitors might be thinking of. So the, not our students, but the descendants whose parents were in different camps and they're coming here and want to see it. Um, so, so you have soldiers, you have death by bullets, death by bullets. of course. Um, but it's an important story. More sensitive material is in these drawers. Um, this is talking about the real, you know, tech, technical details of the genocide that we wanted to make sure was not um, was not overly uh, big on the wall and graphics. So these are in drawers that students are encouraged to pull out and explore. Um, then you get into um, forced labor, um, the specific experience of women. Um, this is an incredible artifact. This I is the hearts, point the paper, point the yeah. bread hearts. Yeah, so these were made by George Brady's mother, who was able to send them from the camp that she was in. Her kids had not yet been taken away. She took her bread ration, chewed it up, and shaped them into these heart charms for um, her two kids, Hannah and George, and her niece, Vera. And they have their initials on them, and she then was able to paint them with her toothpaste um, that she had. And so those are a very special artifact. You don't shy away from the medical experiments as well. And uh... um, Right behind you is a section about um, non-Jews who took great personal risk to help Jews. So we wanted to make sure we tell that story as well. Shuni Sugihara, for example, yes. Mm -hmm. Irina Sendler, a social activist who became a leader of the Polish resistance. And then in this corner, this is really important to us, the Jewish response to atrocity. Um, of course, the narrative of sheeps to slaughter is not something we wanted to include. And so we really gave a lot of thought during the entire writing of the text that this wasn't 
just a passive experience that happened to the Jews. The Jews had agency, even if they couldn't make decisions, they were people who this was happening to. And so just small things, and you didn't have to take up arms to fight in resistance. There were other ways to resist as well, spiritual um, resistance as well, Um, making art and teaching children in the ghetto about about keeping Shabbat and the traditions. That also is an important part of resistance. And it says here, very important, surviving by hiding, which um, has not been really paid much attention to in previous Holocaust education, but this now is being seen as a new form of resistance by scholars. And Right behind you is something also that's not typically done in Holocaust museums. Oscar Groening, the accountant of Auschwitz. And this is the stories of Nazi perpetrators and collaborators. Who were the perpetrators? So there's um, a number that, of them that you can choose to hear from. Hans Frank was the governor general of Poland. Um, Otto Ollendorf, who was an Eisensgruppe commander. So a Nazi guard, a female Nazi guard. Um, Amon Goss, of course, Amon famous Goss, uh, yeah. from and Schindler's you can List. Hear, you can see photos. There's some video from testimony. I think... For us, it was really important because it's such an important teachable moment to look at it from all perspectives, right? The the victims, the survivors, the perpetrators, the the righteous Gentiles, the bystanders. and Righteous among the nations. Yeah. Yeah, and it was really important for us to show that full spectrum of human behavior. And um, I think it wasn't done before because it was considered like, oh, we don't talk, we don't do that. Like, we don't talk of it. But then you see... Or why like, give them a, any give, attention or Don't give or them platform. a platform. But I think as, as, as a space dedicated to teaching the Holocaust today, I think it's really important to look at that full spectrum. Yeah. It also, when you just watch it, they seem like ordinary looking people. Right. And that's another poignant really reminder. Really important part, that they went home to families at the end of the day after they left these their posts as prison guards or commandants or Eisengruppen, you know. There's a photo in there, actually, of a group of them who, whose job it was to murder people in pits and then, like, having a party afterwards. I think those sides of it are really important for people to see. So this gallery now that you're in is liberation and aftermath. So you have this narratives of Jews um, in DP camps trying to find countries that would let them in, the different agencies that um, help them. You have the birth of the state of Israel. You have people returning home and realizing there was nothing there. Everything is gone. Or returning home like you know, the Celts pogrom and experiencing you know, hatred again and again. Um, and the Meanwhile in Canada section here talks about the return of military, Canadian Jewish military back home after the war. And um, the map in this section t- allows you to explore where people went, where they were, where they were going after the war. So wow, what is, oh, wow. Cool. What, is this? what is it? It's a forest. So this is the memorial space, and it's a beautiful forest. And if you approach the wall, you'll see that it darkens. Your presence darkens the wall, and then the names of victims from the Shoah appear. We wanted it to be quiet, away from all the technology of the, of the you experience in the museum, a contemplative space. And we chose a forest because, as we know, during the Holocaust, the forest is where people were murdered. It's also a place where people hid and were saved. And then it connects you back to Canada and specifically this campus where we're surrounded by the forests of the ravine. And so it's, it's a very beautiful contemplative space. Yeah, it changes the, it changes the whole yeah. and emotional we're, and tone we're of your visit. It. So this is the final gallery. Okay, we're coming into life in Canada. So, yes, Ellen, you mentioned that this wasn't in the previous um, museum, and you're, and you're right. And it was really important for us to show um, what life was like for survivors who made Toronto their home. So you actually have behind you like a 1960s-style living room, um, and there are photos of 
beautiful, happy simchas, um, people getting married, having children, um, diplomas from survivors who went back to school. Anita Eckstein's York University diploma is there. You also see about the businesses that the survivors started. There's a big clunky, heavy cash register from the um, a family who had a store on DuPont um, who um, saved this cash register because they were so proud of this business that they opened on DuPont Street, one of those stores that sold everything. We also share the, tr- the, the trauma and how hard it was for many to, to, to thrive and rebuild. So in the drawers, there's some medical records from um, survivors and, and the, the difficulties they face, both from physical ailments as, as a result of being in the camps and also the psychological trauma. Um, we really also wanted to celebrate the accomplishments of the survivors. So on this wall, you see this beautiful photo montage of the survivors speaking to hundreds and hundreds of students through, through the years. So we've come to the end of the physical display. How does learning about the Holocaust help combat the rising anti-Semitism and the statistics of Jews still being the number one target in Toronto and across Canada of hate crimes? So... We know that Holocaust education is a tool in our efforts to counter anti-Semitism. Is it always the tool to use? I don't think so, necessarily. But for young people to be introduced to who Jews are, who they were before the war, what happened to them during the Holocaust, why the Nazis targeted them, and then this narrative of they are people, immigrants, just like so much of our population here came to Canada escaping and having survived tremendous hardship. Those are lessons that I think the students of today can really relate to and start to see the the humanity in the narrative, right? And not just learning about us as victims of the Shoah, but learning this full story, I think is really important. And that's why we put so much attention on the pre-war life and on this part of life in Canada, because I think you need all of it. If we just focus on people wanting to kill us, I don't think that's the right message to counter anti-Semitism. It's introducing us who we are as a people who have been targeted through the centuries. So we are leaving the, the, the end gallery. Then after having this sort of heavy experience, where what happens I'll to them? Do they get you. to talk about yeah. it? Do they get to hug each other? Do they yeah, have so, like... Yeah, so like, good question. So follow me into the Eckstein Library where we have the Eckstein Family Learning Lab. And it's a space that is dedicated to, to, to learning and reflecting and dialogue. You can see there's like these bleacher-like seating. We did a lot of consultations with students about how they're most comfortable talking. And so there's different seating areas. There's also these really colorful circular um, poofs and orange and pink and blue that um, we, so we can set up in a circle to have these like circle discussions. So you can see the writing on this panel. What is something that you would want to share with a friend or family member about your experience at the Toronto Holocaust Museum? And the idea is that students will come and put post-it notes, and then the facilitator will collate them and start the conversation. And then one last thing I wanted to show you is this Words Matter board. It's like a, re- gla- a reflective glass surface that students can leave comments on about what they learned and other students and visitors that come in will be able to see it and respond so so you don't want to just send them home with all these feelings no we want them this is the most important part of the whole thing and connect the dots to the present there's not a lot of dead pictures there's not a lot of atrocity pictures there's not a lot of terrible Mm -hmm. hard to the way they used to teach holocaust education when i was little right it's like watch this film that was a real conscious decision um The best practices in Holocaust education today are um, really sort of determined that by being sad and horrified, the learning actually shuts down. That's why it's inquiry-based, right? We know that students learn when they're able to ask questions in different ways and hear different kinds of answers. But when you're just sitting... uh, in front of this horrible, difficult content and then not given the opportunity to reflect, to talk. You're sad, but you're not necessarily learning and thinking critically. And what we want students to walk out of here with is curiosity about this period, wanting to learn more. And so if, if they live, leave here with more questions than answers, then we have actually think we've done our job well. Mm-hmm. well. Thank you so much for this amazing tour and for being on the CJN Daily again.
Thank you so much for having me, Alan. And that's our tour. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. And we'll end with Ontario Premier Doug Ford. He took a tour that morning ahead of the announcement that the province will give half a million dollars to the new Holocaust Museum for educational programming and security so it can reach more people and stay open on Sundays. Thanks for listening. We've put a link to learn more about the museum in our show notes and to read Lila Sarek's feature print story on the CJN website. I had an opportunity to take a tour of the facility and listening to the stories of survivors, listening to your story, Nate, not only what you experienced through the Holocaust, but what you experienced when you arrived in Toronto and how you started your life here. I encourage every single person within the Jewish faith, but outside the Jewish faith, that you come by and take a tour. It's, it's chilling to say the least, and really get educated on, on what happened. And it's critical that we have people from all across Ontario come by and take a tour. And you get a, a real uh, sense of the atrocities that, that happen. As time passes and the atrocities of the Holocaust grow more distant, it's never been more important that history lives on. 